from Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado. It's the rematch the Browns have long awaited. They've been waiting an entire year to get revenge against the Denver Broncos for losing the AFC Championship last season in Cleveland. Now the time is here. The Browns against the Broncos for the right to go to the Super Bowl. Bernie Kosar for the Browns, John Elway for the Broncos. The Browns dog defense against Elway and company. It should be a tremendous matchup here in Denver, and the weather is ideal. 40 degrees and lots of sunshine today, and it should be a fast track. It'll be the Browns bid again for an AFC championship, something that's eluded them for the past two or three seasons. This time, they think it's their turn. Bernie Kosar was a one-year-old when the Browns last won the NFL championship. Cleveland has celebrated nothing but heartbreak since. The ball on the 13-yard line of the Raiders, who lead 14 to 12. The play came in, red right 88. But with Cleveland needing only a field goal, the Browns appear to be in the driver's seat. Seif is going back to pass, wants to take a shot into the end zone. He looks, he throws! And it's a great play that may have been intercepted, and the Cleveland Browns call on football once too often. Holy Toledo! It was inexplicable to me that we didn't go for a what could have been a chip shot. In the 1985 divisional playoffs, Ernest Biner's 66-yard touchdown lifted the Browns to a 21-3 halftime lead over the top-seeded Dolphins. Moreno gives the ball to Davenport, and he's got the first down, and maybe more. He's going to go all the way. Miami came back to win 24-21. Brian Brennan's acrobatic touchdown gave the Browns a seven-point lead in the 1986 AFC Championship with just over five minutes to play. Then came the drive. And the Broncos are 98 yards away from where they need to go. This was it. They were on their way to the Super Bowl, and then John Elway ruined the party. 42 seconds to go. Broncos at the Cleveland Five. Touchdown! Jackson. After the catch, for me, I could hear a pin drop. Carlos's kick is on the way, and it is gone! Just inches, just inches, that was the difference. The Denver Broncos have come from behind to win it in overtime. In the Super Bowl, the ball did not bounce the Broncos' way, as the Giants captured a 39-20 rout. Denver still without a championship, had suffered its second humiliating Super Bowl defeat. Dallas outdistanced Denver 27-10 in Super Bowl XII. In 1987, the Broncos and the Browns play again for a Super Bowl berth, this time at Mile High. Coming up next, the opening kickoff. Remember to the crowd. I mean, it, it, the the home field advantage it never, I think, was more evident than, than in that ball game up there. The place was actually shaking. The whole stadium was shaking, and it was so noisy inside that stadium that it actually hurt your ears. Second and 19. Ernest Biner 
to the 10, maybe the 11. Biner from East Carolina. He's the heart of that Cleveland offense behind Kozar and highly regarded by his coaches and players. In fact, Biner, according to Marty Schottenheimer, he said, after Kozar, he's the last man I would trade. Third and a dozen. Over the middle. Incomplete. Intercepted. Oh. It's intercepted on the juggle. Freddie Gilbert, number 90. That was the first down. I mean, it was a great call. Webster executed. He just didn't make the catch on the play and ended up being an interception. Watch this ball bouncing right off the hands there. Juggled once by Dennis Smith. But Lilly comes up with it. Gilbert comes up with it. They've got the shot from the 17-yard line. Coming up next, Denver strikes first. Teal for the injured Vance Johnson. He's in the hospital. That groin injury suffered last week. Hemorrhaged. Mark Jackson, Clarence K, the tight end, caught two touchdowns against Houston. Stuttered. Bishop, a pro bowler. Freeman, Humphreys, and Lanier. Uh, the offensive lines. Winder. Hit hard, but close to a first down. He has the first down at about the six-yard line. It was Felix Wright again, the safety man. With Sewell in motion. He throws wide open, touchdown, Ricky Natil. Ricky Natil uh, had a great game. I mean, here's a rookie that's in a, a championship game that steps up and, and makes some huge plays. You can't ask for much more from a rookie and, uh, you know, lose a guy like Vance Johnson. When Vance went down against Houston, uh, I think it was a late hit, guy comes falling on him and uh, ruptured a, a vein in his inner thigh, which uh, actually could have killed him. Uh, I found out later when we started the game uh, against uh, uh, Cleveland for the AFC Championship. Ricky and I have 82 on our towel, and uh, my only advice to Ricky was, you know, here's your opportunity. You know what you can do. Look at this great offensive protection. Elway patiently waits, a little fake, a look away, and now. The Browns countered with bruising runs by fullback Kevin Mack. Bernie Kosar followed with a finesse passing game, arcing his first completion to Ernest Biner. Then came third and one from the Denver 45. This time it's Kevin Mack. Bubbles! And Denver says they have it. They do. Well, after we had the two early turnovers, I think uh, we were in shock, and we thought, you know, what's, what's happening? Is this a curse against us? What are we going to do? I mean, we, we just can't seem to control ourselves and handle our business against the Broncos. That was just a normal thing, I think, and that was reflective in the number of takeaways that we had during the year. That was just a part of what we did all the time in practice. Coach uh, Call, you always looking for turnovers. Deck Cowell, similar to the beginning of last week's game against Houston. Houston drove down the field only to turn the ball over down near the goal line. Here we see the drive. Cleveland driving the football and out in the middle of the field, Lilly strips it away and Denver recovers. Well, the Broncos have their second turnover midway through this first quarter. Elway looking for a bundle, gets away. Those eyes in the back of his helmet to the 48-yard line. Seven minutes left in the first quarter. And Denver looking to add to the seven nothing lead. Gene Lang. To the 10 yard line. Denver usually throwing the football to get this kind of gains. But what a great play by Gene Lang. Explodes into the secondary downfield before they get him out of bounds. And Denver threatening again. They did not have a run that long all year. 29, the longest in the regular season. 42 for Lang. The draw, the winder. And he's inside the five. I actually don't know why they were able to move the ball as well as they did on the ground. Uh, we 
practiced well, I thought we were prepared, I thought everybody was ready to go, and uh, for whatever reason, we just couldn't gel and come together and do something we'd done all season. They had the, uh, the ability, I think, through the threat of the pass, which we probably, in retrospect, focused on more than their running game. Uh, but, but they had the ability to run the ball effectively. Gene Lane steps up, makes a couple really big plays. Sammy Winder is, you know, the, we called him the mud man, but he was Mr. Consistency, and we just pounded it out. At the goal line, the drive stalled. On second down, Elway fumbled the snap. The ball landed just past the Browns' outstretched hands. Elway pounced on it, setting up third and goal. Jackson in motion. Elway over the middle, incomplete. So for the Cleveland Browns, a moral victory. Flag is down, and it may be a motion penalty against Denver. No, holding against Cleveland. Minifield, he played very physical, and he played physical all the time. And for a referee to call something like that, just bumping around in the end zone, we felt like, you know, what, what else do we have to overcome to see to win this game? Reverse Sewell, no one there for Cleveland. A very emotional Cleveland defense moving quickly to try and shut off the run to the right. And Sewell all alone going back to the left. Carlist for the extra point. Kubiak's hold, it's 14-0. Up next, Kosar attempts to rally the Browns. McNeil coming up to the 12. At the 30-yard line. You know, we're down 14 to nothing, but, you know, we were moving the football early on these guys. You know, we were making plays. Those are down the middle to Ozzie Newsom, and the veteran tight end has a first down at the Denver 45. Dennis Smith made the tackle, 25 yards on the play. Ozzie Newsom invading the territory patrolled by Dennis Smith, 49. You see how much room he had there as Smith late in arriving to make that tackle. Bolstered by Newsom's 25-yard reception, the Browns marched downfield. But at the Denver 38, the Browns needed another big gainer to keep the drive alive. Third and 17. He has a man, and it's Clarence Weathers first down at the 19. There's a defensive line for Denver, front three. And their linebackers, Fletcher, Mecklenburg, a star, Hunley, and Ryan. And the secondary, Dennis Smith, number 49, for the injured Harden with Haynes and Wilson at the corners, Lily the other safety man. Just inside the Denver 20, final minute, first quarter, 14-0 Broncos. And this final, nothing there. Andre Townsend again. 15 minutes gone, Denver in early control. Up next, the Browns let a scoring chance slip through their fingers. Now down in the noisy end of the stadium, Second and ten into the flat, but nothing much there for Ozzie Newsom. Give him two. Mark Haynes, the cover man. Gilbert applying pressure on Kozar, who's sidearmed for two yards. Down the middle, incomplete. Flag down. Langhorn, the intended receiver. Mark Haynes on the cover. But a flag is down on the near side. In an area that we would expect to see either a holding call or an illegal bump call. That's it. That'll give the Browns a first down. First down. Got through a tackle by Roland Jones and edged inside the 10. A gain of five or six. Second and five from the eight. It's only a couple. Goes 
Lazar having trouble hearing and Jim Tunney this is an official's timeout on the goal line going in the best way to quiet a crowd is to score that south stands down there is nuts that you can't quiet them down that's like trying to quiet down the dog pound in Cleveland Biner is open in the flat but can't make the catch he'll just sidearm this ball out to Biner but Biner feels the pressure he knows he's going to get the hit Biner did not handle the pass, and he's mad at himself. He is a very reliable receiver, but that one went through his hands. A 29-yard attempt by Matt Barr. And Cleveland erases the zero on their side of the scoreboard. And with 13 minutes left in the first half, it's 14-3 for the home team. Cleveland. Uh, was the underdog and they played like it. They, they uh, was a very nervous first half and their possessions were sloppy. I know Dan was thinking let's just control the ball, uh, run some short dink routes and uh, you know he was pretty sure that we could win the game with that strategy. Denver's methodical offensive attack continued to overwhelm and frustrate a reeling Browns defense. First down at the 46, and there goes the flag. Late hit. Chris Rockins came in late, number 37. They're going to have to restrain Clarence K, who is furious, and rightfully so. No reason in the world to come up and take that kind of late shot. And I think maybe one reason these Denver players are so angry is because Vance Johnson was put out of the game this game and last week's game with that kind of late shot. And he went right for the head of Elway. And that'll cost Cleveland 15. Again, shotgun on first down. Wide open underneath is Mateel. He can fly. First down at the 25. Mateel coming all the way across underneath, able to get open underneath the zones for Cleveland on that last play. Winder on a delay, did not go Cleveland. Clay Matthews, pro bowler again this year, number one pick out of Southern California there to make the stop. Dick, I'm amazed at how well this Denver Bronco team has been able to run the ball against that Bear defense. That'll be five or six yards shy of a first down. Every time they seem to get Denver stopped, there goes Elway, either scrambling away, getting extra time, or simply running with the football. And I think uh, in looking back at this game, maybe the, the, the most important difference between these two teams was Elway's scrambling ability. to the one yard line. That far from another touchdown. And the touchdown for Gene Lang. Caps an impressive 80 yard drive by the Broncos. We mentioned the Cleveland Browns wanted Denver to come inside and play the physical game. They have, and they're doing a pretty fine job of it. Leading not just by exhortation, but by example. Rulon Jones's sack did indeed force Cleveland into a three and out. Meanwhile, the Browns defense was seemingly unable to contain the slippery Elway. After three consecutive incompletions, 
Rich Carlos's field goal try missed badly to the left. Led by the brilliant running of Mack, the Browns willed their way back into Denver territory. Then, once again, self-destructed. First, Webster Slaughter was flagged for a 15-yard personal foul. On the next play, Tony Robbins and Jeremiah Castile combined to knock the ball free from Brian Brennan, resulting in the Browns' third turnover. Following the two-minute warning, Cleveland's defense finally responded, twice sacking Elway and forcing the Broncos' first punt. Kosard took over with 38 seconds left in the half. After completing a 24-yard pass to Webster Slaughter, the Browns had enough time for a field goal attempt. Matt Barr's 45-yard kick was wide right. One of the things that really strikes me about this football game is how horribly things had gone for Cleveland in that first half. And yet, they didn't give up. Up next, the second half. The Browns fight back. We get in at halftime, Lemmy and Fani was our offensive coordinator. He said, we're down 21 to three, but he made a profound statement to us. He said, well, we're going to play this game like it's 14 to seven. We're not gonna come out, get into a two minute offense and just, you know, throw it every play. We don't need to do anything extraordinary. Let's just go play. Stop and sort it out like it was when we practiced it all week. Call here, the mind has to be clear so that we can execute. So clear your minds, think about the way we worked it and practice this way. We don't have to be spectacular. It's really tough, especially on the road, to turn the momentum around. Uh, so going in at halftime, we really felt like we had them right where we wanted them. Johnson lines it to Bell. Woo. Looked like an outfielder and returns to the 25-yard line. Winder on first down. Couple of yards, Sam Clancy and Richie Camp, 96. Elway on second and nine. Sewell in motion, the all-purpose back. Elway's going to throw to him, and he's hit hard at the 27. We have a penalty flag on the far side of the field, and I believe they're going to call that one back. Holding 23 offense. To the shotgun goes Elway at his own 16. Center screen to Winder. Down at the 24-yard line. Jump him now, Mike Flat. Third and 11 for Elway. There's that Tarkington roll. And then the throw downfield. Intercepted. Felix Wright. The number one thing we, we said we needed to do was to get some pressure on Elway because he sometimes would make bad decisions when he started scrambling around because he's a, a true competitor and he wanted to win and sometimes he tried to do more than the play would allow. Elway makes a very dumb throw, makes a mistake, had not made mistakes in the first half. He made a dumb mistake and Cleveland suddenly had hope. It raised our spirits because we realized, okay, finally something's gone in our favor. So Bernie Kosar and Cleveland set up at the Denver 35. Kevin Mack. Ooh, to the 22-yard line. And first down, it's Biner this time. Can't get outside, and there was Andre Townsend again. Right now, Kosar going into the noisy end of the stadium. Six seconds on the 32nd clock. Four, three, two. Throwing for Langhorn. Touchdown, Reggie Langhorn. The Browns have capitalized. When they got that touchdown pass, then maybe a little bit of doubt entered into our minds. Because going up to that point, we felt like they weren't going to score. So now the game changes. Now, instead of being down 18, you're down 11 with uh, a quarter and three quarters still to go. I don't know what it was that Kosar saw 
but I believe he was calling an audible the minute he lined up and came out to the line of scrimmage. Under great pressure with the dog, drops that ball to Langhorn in front of Dennis Smith. 18-yard touchdown for the Browns. Johnson hits it high and deep. Ken Bell will not run it out. So from the 20, Elway starts out in the shotgun first down. Right on the money, Mark Jackson, one of the 5'9 amigos. Double tight end with K on the right side and Mobley now in motion from the right side. It's the fan blocker, but it doesn't work that time. As Reggie Camp submarining with help. Third and inches. Well, they would often sneak in this situation. Not this time. Easily for Lang, but a flag goes down right in the center of the pile. And the Browns say they saw a hole. Let's see if that's what the officials call. Holding offense, number 62. So third and ten and a half. Elway runs into his own man and finally throws it complete to Jackson, who gets a first down and more. He may go all the way. You're on the field and all you're thinking is, you know, this is daggone Elway. You're saying to yourself, you know, uh, this guy is a pain in the neck. John had done it so many times uh, that year, the year before, ever since he'd been there, where you sit there and you, you know, say, oh my goodness, we're getting ready to get sacked. And then he jumps around and actually ran into one of his own players on that particular play and, and still hits Mark Jackson. And Mark makes a great run. Mark Harper misses the tackle, and then I see safety, Felix Wright. I just knew if I could make a move on Felix, I didn't see anything. And uh, put a little stutter step on him, and uh, he fell for it. I took off, and I'm sprinting down the sideline, and all I see is the end zone, and all I'm thinking about is the glory that's going to come to me. People on the sideline, I look back at it, are like they're at a horse race, and they're like waving you in. Come on, man, make it, make it, make it. Well, I think a horse, a gorilla, a monkey, and about three orangutans jump on my back at about the 15-yard line, and my butt starts to tighten up, and everything. And, I'm, and I, I take a look back to see if there's anybody following me, and I'm thinking, why is this guy chasing me? Let me go to the end zone. And uh, he makes a dive right at the end there as I fall into the end zone. So, uh, needless to say, uh, totally out of gas. He barely gets it in the end zone, you know, but uh, if you look at the, the play, he started in motion, went across the field, came all the way back across the field, turned and went upfield. Saw John scrambling, came back for him, and then you know ended up going 80 yards. So he probably ran about 100, and, you know, 20, 130 yards on that particular play. And and Mark did a great job of getting that ball in the end zone. The longest touchdown play in postseason history. Side game, Mack and Biner, two north-south runners. He gets five. Mack again for only a yard. Jim Ryan and Ricky Hunley collaborate. 28 to 10, Denver leads. Eight minutes left, third quarter. Biner. Complete at the 37. Rick Dennison made the tackle. Kozar wide open is Langhorn. And the saving tackle by Dennis Smith. Seven minutes left in the third quarter. Kozar to Biner. Well thrown. Ernest Biner. Touchdown. Bernie Kosar was uh, was interesting right off the bat. Uh, 
tall, gangly. I mean, he still looked like a, a little kid, even in, in his third and fourth year in the NFL. Not great mobility. In fact, uh, uh, absolutely awkward at times. Had to develop a style where he had one foot back so he could get away from the center uh, more quickly because he was getting run over by his own lineman. When Biner caught the touchdown pass. We had uh, supposed to be a three deep zone. We had a couple guys playing two deep zone. We were supposed to have four guys pass rushing. We only had three guys pass rushing. It was really a, a mental problem on our part. Kosar has a brilliant mind, and he knew how to use that mind to effectively help his team in all kinds of situations. Was that a touch play by Kosar? We've seen the power game of Elway. That's just like a little easy free throw that he tossed up there and let Biner perfectly. When Kosar... Uh, sees you making a mistake, he's going to jump all over it. That was a great pass. That was, that was a, you know, a real good over-the-shoulder catch for a running back to make. Ernest had such great hands. His hands are enormous, large, large hands. Uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie and he had really a great uh, synergy, if you will, in their ability to kind of anticipate where one another, where, where Ernest was going to be. I think the players were at a point saying, hey, we, we can't let up because of Ernest Biden. Number one, uh, the kind of player that he was and what he was capable of doing. But we did. Coming up next, the Broncos continue to stumble. Trailing 28 to 17 midway through the third quarter, the Browns kicked off. Ken Bell's muff pinned the Broncos inside their own 10. The Browns forced Denver into a three and out. Following Gerald McNeil's return, Cleveland took possession at the Broncos 42. Unexpectedly, the game had turned. Cleveland has it at the 42. Dumps it on the screen to Mack and good blocking. And Mack has about 10. Craig Cregan. The nose tackle from behind. In the Cleveland scheme of things, that is really a running play rather than a pass. They do not run the ball with a sweep very often. Those are looking for slaughter. And a juggling catch at the 10-yard line. They say he stepped out at the 12. First down. Ball was hanging out there, though, very close to an interception going the other way by Wilson. And suddenly, Cleveland threatening to make this a battle. Mack. Boy, the way he runs, you'd almost think he was named after the truck. Eight more yards. Second and two at the four. Biner, touchdown Cleveland. Biner's second score of this third quarter. When it got to 28 24, um, we were scrambling. We were making mistakes we normally don't make. Uh, we were, uh, we really, uh, I think in, in some ways, we're panicking. Browns have come roaring back and. You've got to sense the kind of confidence it takes from that far back not to lose your enthusiasm, to have the kind of courage to put it back in the end zone and get back into this game. We get set for the kickoff. The Browns have scored 21 points in this third quarter. The Broncos regulars in the season gave up 21 points or more only three times in a game. With under 19 minutes left in the game. A four-point contest. Winder. Flag down as Winder picks up 10. Maybe a face mask. Take a quick peek at it. Sims playing for the injured Dave Pizzulli. You see him reaching in. Getting whatever he could to try and get the tackle. Get it stopped. But those penalties are very costly. Lang. Read well by Mike Johnson. Mobley in motion, shotgun. Wide open is Mark 
Jackson breaks another tackle. And finally is out of bounds at the Cleveland 40-yard line. He's got that spin move down pat. Jackson put a great move on Hanford Dixon. Missed tackle right there. And I'll tell you, that has been costly for these Browns today. That's that fast break football we talked about. Big play offense for the Broncos. First down. Reiner protecting the ball for three. Lucius Sanford. Number 50 with a tackle. Shotgun on early downs. Ellis on a blitz. They pick it up. Mobley. The giant tight end with a first down. Leading to the 29. He's hurt. So is the Cleveland tackler. Harper. That is a mix, mismatch. Harper is 174 pounds. And Mobley's about 274. I really believe this is one of the most physical football games I've ever seen. I don't remember a game in which you saw more players being carried or helped to the sideline. Down to the one minute mark third quarter. First down inside the 30 for Elway. Underneath and Mateel can't hang on. Elway going for Mateel. Out of the field of play, not a catchable ball, and Minifield really had the inside shut off. Third and ten for Elway. Big, big play for this Cleveland defense and for Elway. Goes to the ground to Bodie, trying to cross him up, and he almost made it. Nine yards for Bodie on the draw to the shotgun. Now, Dan Reeves. Sends in the field goal team. That would, if successful, give him a seven-point lead. 38-yard attempt by Carlos. Straight. Denver leads 31-24. McNeil, the only deep man for Cleveland, as Carlos kicks it off. Final seconds, third quarter. McNeil's going to return this one, I believe. smothered at the 13. Mitch Andrews downfield and Bruce Klosterman at the end of the third quarter. Coming up, Kosar and Biner attempt to tie the score. did a whale of a job number 73 third down and four down the middle Biner's open Ernest Biner with Lily to beat and Lily finally rustles him down at the 27 yard interesting to see the the total difference in the styles of Kosar and Elway Elway the power pitcher I mean he's throwing it right through guys Kosar shot putting the ball he's flipping it out with one hand side arming it we started to appreciate how good Bernie Kosar was in that second half and uh, not not the uh, powerful threat to run as Elway uh, did or the great long arm but so very accurate in his uh, passes Kosar and Biner the men that Schottenheimer penciled in as his top two players. He said those are the last two guys I'd ever lose in a trade. And they collaborate again for a big Cleveland play. The other thing he said, when the going gets tough, we want the ball in the hands of Ernest Biner. Ernest was a great player, and he got open, gets down, you know, got down the seam and, and, and makes some plays against us. And that's the kind of plays great big game players make. 
37 yards away from a tying touchdown the Cleveland Browns. Newsom inside the 20. Second and two. A half yard. Kozar, 10 for 10 in the second half, looks at third and two, a long two. by Kevin Mack to the five-yard line. Oh, my. It ain't over with yet. 14 tough yards. It's first and goal at the five. on to the field as we watch Kosar unloading that ball at the last second. And that was a great throw. Well, I'll tell you, it's right there where only Fontenot had the chance at the football. Third and goal. Four wide receivers. Underneath the slaughter for a touchdown. We're in the red zone and I'm lined up in bump, man bump. Uh, our whole game plan that, that day was to force the Cleveland receivers to our safeties. As I'm sitting there in man bump, Webster Slaughter gives me a little move at the line, and he goes inside. I'm saying, hey, great, he, he's going to my safety. Uh, Kosar and the passer that he is, great passer that he is, boy, he's able to pinpoint the pass and get it between Dennis Smith and myself. Uh, Kosar perhaps answering what can we do to answer the drive of last year that kept us from going to the Super Bowl? We've got to put a few drives together of our own. An 87-yard drive. This to tie it. 31 apiece. Coming up, Elway's legs betray him. starting to click to, to do some things. We had been a, uh, a real strong defensive team all year long, and we weren't used to that. It was, it was worrisome. We stop on one time, we'll go ahead. Looking for Sewell, instead goes to Mark Jackson, and he has a first down at the 42, as Denver's Elway trying to answer Cleveland's Kozar. Time were nine minutes and 38 seconds from San Diego. Ooh. Sewell straightened by David Grayson, a rookie at linebacker from Fresno State. Number 56. Third down and a short three. Draw to that draw. Doesn't work. Stopped at the 49, a yard short. at nose tackle, Daryl Sims. Bob Golick, the pro bowler, hurt. His replacement today, Pizzulli, injured, and here's Sims. 
And Dan Reeves has sent his offensive team back onto the field at fourth and one. And just inside of Cleveland territory, he's going to take a most interesting gamble. We're really just going to let the clock run down and then, you know, punt the football, you know, from five yards deeper. At that particular point, it really doesn't hurt you. Uh, but Cleveland did call a timeout, which became critical at the end. Cleveland called a time. They thought a fake was in the works, and now here's that boots punt by Elway off the side of his foot. Not a good one. It's coming back to the 32-yard line. You eliminate the possibility of a return if you, you know, have John Elway punt it. And John does a, you know, a great job. If you get it down inside the 20, you've kind of pinned them back. Unfortunately, the ball bounced back. Uh, we were sitting there. I think most guys on defense, when John uh, dropped back to kick, to kick the ball at Lapooch punt, man, we was like, "Oh no, what are we doing? We need our, we need a regular punter in there. This is not uh, what we were writing in the, in the script for the game." And Kozar hitting Kevin Mack over the middle, out to the 37-yard line, with eight minutes. Remaining in the game. How many teams could survive the confidence breaks that this Cleveland Brown team had the first half? Second and five. Kozar going for a bundle, and he's got Slaughter in the clear and overshoots him. Oh, ho, ho. Steve Wilson had Slaughter slipping behind him. Kozar, no lack of arm strength there. That ball in the air, about 50, 55 yards. Third down, five yards. for one of the turnovers of the first half as he fumbled after a reception. Little guy from Boston College who idolizes Steve Largent. Good pass again by Kosar. Dick, I was watching Larry Williams on that play. A badly sprained ankle. He's in there with Kosi has moved to center. Boy, I tell you, they're playing their hearts out in that Cleveland offensive line. Matt cut off by Jim Ryan. Good play by Ryan. The smallest of the linebackers the Denver Broncos. They list him at 218. The blitz is on. And the long pass downfield is knocked away brilliantly by Haynes. Brennan had touchdown written on that one as he had slipped deep. But Mark Haynes saves it for Denver. Some confusion there as Webster Slaughter brought his man right into the end of that play. Unusual to see two receivers in this Cleveland Offense bumping together as you look from the reverse angle. We had a pretty complicated defense. We did many, many different things. It was much more mental than physical in a lot of ways. And when you make a mental error in that type of a defense, you're in big trouble. So we were trying to calm each other down and say, hey, we stopped them all first half. You know, we can stop them now. This is when it really counts. Whatever's gone on before it doesn't matter. Let's stop them now. Fourth quarter. sidelines. Oh, great hands. But well short of a first down at the 47. Miner lost his feet on the sideline. Still able to catch that ball, but not able to pick up the first down. And Denver's defense rising to the occasion here. Lee Johnson, who has kicked well today, although not so well since being acquired from Houston. Up next, one last drive for Elway and Kosar. Five minutes and 14 seconds. Does that sound familiar? Wasn't it about that time last year in Cleveland when Elway and Denver started on there too? I mean, it's a new ball game now. You know, we got to go out and try to find a way to win it. Uh, you know, everything that you'd fought for up to that point, now it's, you know, just starting over again. And we're at home, and we feel good. You know, we feel good about being in Mile High Stadium. You know, the crowd is is behind you, and you got John Elway, and anything's possible. You know, when you got John. Natiel at midfield. What a great 
great pattern and what a great throw. Boy, that's a great play. Again, credit to offensive, the offensive line of these Broncos who gave Elway the time to get that ball downfield. Winder meets Sam Clancy and company. Right, the deep man, ball overthrown by the strong armed Elway. He did seven for a first down. Natil will get more net to the 21 yard line. Oh, that ball, can't, you couldn't take it out there and hand it any better to Natil. They spotted at the 20-yard line with four minutes and 12 seconds left. remember about that touchdown was maybe we scored too quickly. <laughs> Just a little screen for Sammy Winder. You let the defensive lineman go through. Winder hides momentarily. And now Winder does his thing. Good running, a missed tackle there, a second missed tackle. Minifield, the second man to miss him. This Cleveland defense has been hurt badly by a missed tackle. There's a little blood block right there. delivered and it'll be Bernie Kosar with four minutes left to get his chance when we go out on the field we're down by seven we've been down by 18 we have been down by 11 so we're only down by seven but they haven't stopped us all game we had their defense on their heels we feel like we had momentum on our side we was in rhythm we were on a roll so we felt like we could go down and get another touchdown we had to stop them. We knew going it. We didn't want to go overtime. Please, Bernie, make it happen. Well, when you're a kid and you grow up some 70 miles from Cleveland as a Browns fan, you dream about certain opportunities. We all did it in our youth. Put ourselves in the position of our heroes. Bernie Kozar grew up a Cleveland Browns fan. Now it's his turn to rally Cleveland. Up the middle, Biner. He has 20, they got 16 yards, and a blast that opened quickly. Cleveland continues to mix their plays well, in particular here in the second half. And we talked about rhythm. We talked about getting things hammering. They still want to play that physical game. Liner, a physical money player. They took advantage of him there. They've got it outside of their own 40 and moving in. On the ground again to Biner. Grand climax to the American Football Conference season. 30 seconds back of four. Those are underneath for Brennan. Bucks in with a first down at the 44 of Denver. 14 yards on the play. What an alert play by Marty Schockenheimer. He counted the number of players out there. Waved off. Evan back. Brennan doing a good job working there on Dennis Smith. The same matchup that scored their touchdown to tie that game last year. Two minutes and ten seconds. Kozar to Brennan again to the 24-yard line at the two-minute timeout. The Cleveland Browns are 24 yards away from tying it again in Denver. You had to reflect back on the year before because just as Denver had stolen the game in the final quarter with that first and 98 drive, now it was the Browns in the second half that seemed to have all the momentum. You don't think history is going to repeat itself, but this game was beginning to have overtime written all over it. Late in that game, we looked at each other and I think with the same expression that uh, 
payback time. Isn't isn't this world of the National Football League a, a wonderful place that as disappointed as those, as those fans were in Cleveland and the players and coaches, now Marty Schottenheimer and the Browns were going to turn the tables and they then, with all this momentum, were going to be the winner in a uh, possible overtime. It didn't look good, honestly. I mean, they were like a machine rolling down the field. And when you're standing there watching that and you're watching these guys just perform perfectly, uh, it, 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 it gives you some hope that, okay, this, we can do this. We're going to win this game. We're going to tie it up, and then ultimately we're going to win it. Before the snap, the charge by Andre Townsend. He was called earlier. Encroachment, defense, and number gets 61, it second five-yard five penalty. to have a first down or close to as Dennison and Smith make the tackle at the 13-yard line. 38-31 Denver. To Biner. Oh, he was lucky he didn't collide with that upright of the goalpost. Again, a very accurate pass, and we mentioned Biner's abilities as both catcher and blocker and runner. You've seen that today. Look how well thrown this pass is. Well, he would have been out. He would have been out of that end zone. Second and ten. Offsides number. Incomplete intended for Langhorn. In essence, a free down for Kozar. Well, you don't want to make a mistake in that kind of critical situation. But this Denver defense traditionally makes so many big plays in critical conditions and down near their own goal line. These are the toughest yards in football right here. There was never any doubt in my mind that we should give the ball to, to, to Ernest Bynum. He was the reason we were still alive at that point. I can tell you, number one, what we were thinking is turnover. Let's get the ball back. in a very disadvantageous position. I was sitting in the visiting owner's box next to the press box in old Marl High Stadium. And for, through some idiotic design, we, we, were, we had to look through three windows and everything was almost distorted. I saw a, a scramble. I had no idea what it was until I saw the Denver players jumping up in, in sheer exhilaration. They knew something went wrong. As he took that handoff, uh, and the collision was made with Castile. I know my call was hesitant because I thought Biner was going in for the touchdown. Had he not hesitated at the goal line, that's when I stopped. I was about to say, Biner, touchdown! Oh my, 38-38! What, what a game this is. Instead, uh, there was a, this silence for a fraction of a second. Biner frozen, and then you realize that he had fumbled the ball. I didn't see the ball come out. Unfortunately, it was what Ernest didn't see that created the problem for us. Um, uh, you know, obviously the disappointment when it came out and they got the ball, but um, the way the play unfolded, the wide receiver was responsible for the corner. If the play and bump and run on you, then you release outside, he'll cover you, and you just run up in the corner of the end zone. Right at the last minute, I decide, hey, I got beat last time bumping this guy. I said to myself, well, why don't I back off so that I can get a real good picture of everything as it's happening? Well, what happened to the receiver is he he wanted to watch the play. He took one step outside. Castile turned around when the receiver stopped to see what was going on, and he then saw the ball being run by Ernest. By backing off and getting about six, seven yards off of him, when the draw play happened, I could see it, uh, see the play develop, and it gave me a chance to beat uh, Webster Slaughter and keep him from getting a chance to block me and, and come up and get in position. And as I'm approaching, uh, 
Biner, I'm sitting there thinking, uh, how do I want to try to tackle him? Well, uh, the entire second half, he's pretty much run over everybody on our defense. And uh, I said, no, oh, that's not going to do any good. If I try to come up and tackle this guy, he's just going to run me over and go into the end zone. Uh, best thing for me to try to do is strip the ball. Ernest Biner never saw him coming. Jeremiah Castile, number 28, reaching in to strip that ball away. This Denver defense trained to reach at that football, to fly, try to force those turnovers. They led the AFC this year in turnovers, tearing the heart out of Cleveland's offense. Reiner, who had picked up the first down, had ball out away from his body, and Castile, a reject from Tampa Bay, acquired on waivers by the Broncos, not only stripped it, but recovered it in the biggest play of his football life. The recovery is made by the Broncos where? On the two-yard line. And wasn't it just a year ago that the Broncos had the ball on the two-yard line? And, uh, and that led to the victory. The year before with the drive, the, the drive basically tied the game up. We still had life. As soon as that fumble occurred, it was over. And now, uh, much to the uh, chagrin of, of Biner and, and the Browns and their fans, uh, this uh, golden moment uh, was just struck down uh, by a a defensive back that nobody wanted earlier in the year, Jeremiah Castile. The, the, the standing line in, in Denver was he hasn't made a tackle uh, in the NFL for three years, and then he's the one who knocks the ball free in, in the biggest uh, uh, forced fumble of his career and maybe of uh, in Denver history. Kozar did everything right. He got the ball to the man that they want to have it, as we talked about during the course of this day, Ernest Biner, two cities football crazed for the fans of Cleveland again. Yeah, I know nobody felt as bad about that as Ernest did. You know, he felt like he had let us down, the city down, the team down. I, I can't even describe the depth of the pain that was in his eyes. But a low moment. I mean, how, how difficult it must be in, in the great arena, uh, television and, and 80,000 people nearly watching you in person to have the opportunity to be the star, and he was the star in that game. He was the man that Kozar went to, caught seven passes, and led the team in rushing that day, and had that just ripped away from him. There's not a more competitive uh, player who cares about his performance, who cares whether or not you win or lose, even above his own personal accolades, than Ernest Biner. And his performance that day kept us in the game. And then, unfortunately, an error takes us out of it. In the game's final moments, Denver's Mike Horan sacrifices an intentional safety, giving Kosar time for one last gasp. But just like Biner on the drive before, he comes up painfully short. The Broncos celebrate their 38-33 escape and second consecutive AFC championship. The Browns are once again left to ponder how close they came. I felt very sorry for Ernest Biner. He's a wonderful young man. He was, he, you couldn't console him, couldn't comfort him in the dressing room. But I took him in my arms and I said, listen, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't even be here. Yeah, but it was just wasn't meant to be. A lot of people tried to blame Ernest. And thankfully, the people around him, that we wouldn't do it. I mean, there's no blame. If, to, no, there's no way you can blame one guy. It's one of the tragic events uh, of, of games, uh, lots of games, that it comes down to one play. And yet, this should not have been that way. One play should not uh, change the outcome of a game. But this one was so obvious and, and so open that it came to characterize the game. I mean, it's the fumble. I actually cried on the airplane. You know, I talked big up in front of the media about not crying. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to handle this like a man. But uh, on the airplane, I, 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 I let go because it, it hurt bad. It really hurt. I felt like I let everybody down. Two weeks later, unknown running back Timmy Smith gained a Super Bowl record 204 rushing yards as the Redskins drubbed the Broncos 42 to 10. Two years later, the Broncos again beat the Browns in the AFC Championship 
and once more, the Broncos were trounced in the Super Bowl, this time by the 49ers, 55 to 10, the most lopsided defeat in Super Bowl history. As for Biner, he was traded to Washington after the 1988 season. He was the starting halfback in Super Bowl 26 and scored Washington's first touchdown. The Redskins won 37-24. He even enjoyed a second go-around with the Browns in 1994 and 1995. He ended his 14-year NFL career with the Baltimore Ravens in 1997. He left as the NFL's 16th all-time leading rusher. Yet, he will be best remembered for what happened on the two-yard line on that fateful day in Denver. That, that, that's what happens in sports. You remember for the one glaring mistake, not your accomplishments. You talk about Ernest Barney, you talk about the fumble. I'm, I'm guilty of the same thing everyone else is when they look at Ernest Biner's career, or even that game. It's like, uh, you know, how could he fumble right then? But I reviewed the film before this interview, and I looked at it, and he made big play. He probably made six or seven big plays that put him in position to have a chance to, to tie the thing at the end. So when I think about his career, I'm, I'm going to try not and think about that fumble, because that was a great play by Jeremiah is what that was. And for Biner, uh, the man, um, I suspect that he, uh, he still lives with it all and can't stand the fact that he might meet any stranger any time. And when his name is announced or introduced right away, that person says, oh, yeah, 87, Denver, the fumble. Uh, how, uh, how very difficult that must be.